but the people of the village go to the house of the person who was abducted and they burn the whole house down. So the penalty is so high. For trophy hunting, I went with Tom Roberts. We as WWF Pakistan uh, rolled up our sleeves and we opposed the government issuing any invitations to the Arabs to come and hunt here. Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Fawzia Parveen and I'm a postdoctoral fellow and an adjunct faculty at the Center for Water Informatics and Technology, which is housed in the Syed Babar Ali School of Science and Engineering at LAMS. Today, I have the privilege of speaking with Syed Babar Ali Sahab on his engagement with the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Not just WWF Pakistan, but WWF International as well. Babar Sahib, how was the idea of establishing a WWF Pakistan chapter conceived? And can you walk us through the progress of this organization in Pakistan? You know, somewhere in the 1960s, um, a number of um, concerned uh, naturalists, scientists, uh, who were world famous like Aldous Huxley, um, Sir Peter Scott, Guy Mountford, they all got together and felt that the rare animals of this world were getting rarer. And they were being uh, killed through um, hunting, through poaching, and through encroachment of land. So they then um, thought that they should bring some important people and a world figure who could um, be their face to the world because very few people take notice of scientists. So they approached Prince Bernard who was the uh, consort of the Queen of the Netherlands. They thought and I think they were quite right that the people who want to ha preserve these animals who are keen on hunting, they want the animals to be there. So they approached him and he agreed to, um, to head this organization, what they at that time thought would be World Wildlife Appeal, so that they could go around and talk to people how to preserve these animals. And they organized, a, they consulted lawyers and they thought that the best place to base the headquarters of such an organization would be Switzerland because the Swiss laws are very, very, um, welcoming to international organizations and an organization where you royalty from one of the important European countries of the world. So they set this up. Uh, so this was how the World Wildlife Appeal, uh, worldwide, but it only was, re was uh, registered in Switzerland. And of course, because of Prince Bernard, it had a presence in the Netherlands. And because of Peter Scott and others who were of English origin, they had a, a base a, a base in, in England. And then they started looking around as to where else they could, uh, they could uh, talk about it. Uh, in Pakistan, I had, uh, in, through my business contact, um, a very good friend called uh, Tom Roberts. He was the son of William Roberts, who originally came out to uh, this part of India in the 1900s to set up the Agriculture College Lalpur. He was from Wales. And after he completed his stunt there, stint there, he um, decided to, to stay on in Pakistan. And because he was a, originally a farmer, in, in the Wales. So he took land on lease in Khanewal. At that time, in the 30s and 20s, land was readily available because of the new canal colonization. So he set up a base there. And then he was nominated by the British government, by the Punjab government, to be a member of the Punjab Assembly. So he became a councillor here. And my elder brother, Sayyid Amjad Ali, was also a member of the assembly, so they became friends. And uh, so we were very much interested to, uh, to get into industry and we thought the best industry would be textiles. 
and because of Sir William's uh, background. And he, while he was in Khanewal, he also became representative of the British Cotton Growing Association to grow cotton to be shipped to Manchester to be converted into cloth and brought back to India. So he then uh, talked to Sir William, said, and Sir William readily agreed. He said he, he would be a partner in the setting up of the textile mill. And meanwhile, Sir William's son, Tom, had gone for studies to America. He was in uh, Des Moines. Uh, Des Moines is in, in central um, United States. So uh, he came back from Des Moines and uh, joined this, his father's company and was uh, you know, involved in the textile mill which we had jointly owned. So he became a friend of mine. But Tom's heart was not in, in business. He was a naturalist. He was an artist. He was very much interested in, in animals, birds, drawing. So he, uh, he had a friend a, you know, these people who are like-minded, they, you know, seek each other out. So he discovered that there was a civil engineer working for one of the engineering companies in Mangla by the name of Christopher Savage, who again was very much interested in waterfowl. You know, these birds that migrate from, from Central Asia into, into the warmer lands during the winter. So, so but they were both there and they heard about this wild life appeal and they thought that I would be a good person to, to take an interest in this whole thing. Meanwhile, we got a message. They arranged, they, you know, they were in touch with, uh, with uh, Switzerland and they said there was an interest in Pakistan and uh, how could we link up to the international organization and they said Prince Bernard would be going to to Indonesia because you know Indonesia was a part of of uh, the Netherlands before the war and uh, he would stop over in Karachi and could I meet him along with the, some of the people uh, he didn't want one person but he wanted a number of people who um, would be interested in taking this this cause forward so about seven or eight people like Mumtaz Bhutto and some of his, you know, Mumtaz Bhutto went to Oxford and some of his Oxford colleagues, most of them were from Punjab. There was Manzoor Noon and some others. We all met Prince Bernard at Karachi airport. And he was very keen. He said, this is what it is. Would you help, um, you know, set this up? So everybody said yes. And men, of course, they dispersed that was the end of their enthusiasm. They wanted to meet, meet Prince. Then Tom and Christopher Savage said that now that you've got the nod from Prince Bernard, let's see if we can take this thing forward in Pakistan. So at that time, the head of the planning commission in Islamabad was a gentleman by the name of Mr. S. M. M. Ahmed, who was again a very keen shikari, but somebody who was a very enlightened person and I, I had the privilege of knowing him. I went to see him. I said, we, this is an invitation from Prince Bernard. Would you be prepared to be the chairperson? I, he said, provided you are the secretary because he knew that I would be doing all the legwork. So this is how it came about. And uh, so in, in the coming years, Prince Bernard made a visit here. I took him around these various uh, parks, not to the northern areas, but to uh, Lal Sohara and to the one in Sindh called Kirsar National Park. So he got very much interested and uh, he was happy to see me sort of work with a fair amount of commitment and diligence. And uh, then uh, somebody suggested to him that at, on the international board in uh, in Switzerland, uh, there was no Asian on it. It's all people either from the United States or from Europe. And uh, so he asked me, he said, uh, would you be available? And I said, I was very happy. So this is how I got involved with the international thing. Then um, uh, a couple of years later, Prince Bernard resigned uh, and uh, his place was taken over by, uh, by Mr. John Loudon, who was head of Shell. You know, Shell is a Anglo-Dutch company 
and so it stayed within the Netherlands. And uh, and Loudon came in, and he because he was uh, whole time uh, chairman, and this required a fair amount of time. And he thought that this he would we should get somebody of the same caliber as Prince Bernard. And they approached Prince Philip, who um, uh, was at that time the head of WWF UK. So he came on on board. And of course, uh, he inherited me on the board and then we worked together. And uh, he was very kind to me and I uh, thought that I was doing a fair amount of work here in Pakistan. Prince Philip came on a couple of visits to Pakistan and I took him around. And, uh, and so he then asked me to be a member of the bureau, which meant the executive council. Uh, I became a member, uh, became a member of the executive council. I became the treasurer. I became a vice president. Then finally, when he decided that he had to retire at the age of uh, of 70, he then formed a search committee to to look for his uh, successor. And uh, so I was on the search committee, and we ha we were for a year we were looking around all over the world to find somebody who could uh, fit the needs of WWF, uh, would be not controversial and all that. We were having a, a final meeting on discussing there were a few names in, in the finals. And uh, we, they had hired, the Prince Philip had hired Hydrix and Struggles, which was a very uh, important and famous uh, headhunter, headhunting company. So he brought the head of Hydric and Struggles when the day we were meeting in, uh, in Switzerland, he brought him on his personal plane to Switzerland, to this meeting. So we were going through this whole list and uh, this gentleman from Hydric and Struggles said, well, there is an internal candidate. So I said, who is this? So he said, it's you. I said, I didn't apply. I, I, how can I be? I'm on the search committee. And I think he and Prince Philip had discussed it on the plane. So Prince Philip said, this is not your choice. I said, uh, I said, if you order me to, to take this job, I'll, I'll take it, but I won't serve the full term because I would have come through the back door. And uh, he said, well, it's up to you, but uh, you have to take it over because I want to get rid of it. So this is how I got involved in the in the um, in the central body and then ultimately he was very generous enough to put me uh, in his place shoes are too big for me yeah very very big shoes but in this involvement over the decades with wwf local and wwf international you met incredible people you learned many things from them and you sort of mentioned that in your book as well but what you don't mention is the incredible amount of work that you must have done when you were a part of WWF? Well, it was not an individual's work, it was a teamwork. I mean, uh, WWF uh, by this time uh, had uh, attracted a lot of talent from all over the world. Scientists, uh, economists and uh, political leaders who were there not to uh, blow their own trumpet, but who could influence their own constituency if there was an American or a South American or a European, they could um, they could bring on board the people in their country and could influence them. The whole, you know, the transformation first from saving the what Prince Philip used to call the cuddly animals, the tigers and the bears and the polar bear and this and that. Then it came to um, the habitat. You know, these people, these animals required space, they required protection, they required a place where they could roam, they could breathe, they could breathe uh, freely. And then it came to uh, educating the people. So we thought that let's go to the, to the schools and colleges and universities and expose the coming generation because this is a long-term kind of a commitment and a long-term plan. 
it's not a one generation solution it is it has to go on for to your children and their children and their children so you've got to make sure that they are all on board and they all realize the importance of preserving not only wildlife but preserving habitat with habitat it came to water clean water forest regeneration of forest so it was sort of multiplication of more and more things we were interested in keeping the fish in the rivers and in the oceans sustainable so they said so there should be no overfishing so we got involved with that kind of a thing so it was a round the clock and round the uh, round the world depending on what issues pertaining to uh, to conservation was uh, was applicable and uh, we took no uh, no there was no hesitation to to take the bull by the horns and go and talk to the people right at the top so you mentioned a few things in your book in that part where you're speaking about WWF you've mentioned the hubara busted the mark polo sheep the ibex hunting and some funds that went for karachi's um, bioremediation um i was looking these things up and then i looked at the hubara busted and i realized that the hunters of hubara busted are also responsible or kind of simultaneously patronize the safety of it as well to make sure that it breeds enough for them to come and keep hunting well this was a very naughty naughty i mean k n o w t y a very difficult challenge for us because we as wwf pakistan uh, rolled up our sleeves and we opposed the government issuing any invitations to the arabs to come and hunt here of course uh, there was so much of of vested interest and uh, not only the government in the bureaucracy in the local waderas because when these sheikhs would come they would go give gold watches to everybody they would invite them for hajj to ziyarat to all that kind of thing you know the sky was the limit in their bribing the local people and everybody was for sale here we would always dig in you know our heels and oppose it we went to the press and uh, but we 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 did not succeed but then you know one of the, some of the people in the emirates especially the sheikh of abu dhabi he felt that uh, you know you know in their own country they wiped out the hubara busted they went to morocco they wiped it out uh, and uh, of course they, they indians would not allow them in so they hubara the only area that was of interest to them was pakistan they won't go to iran because the iranis don't welcome the arabs so he invited scientists to see if hubara could be could be bred and uh, it could be sort of whatever they hunt could be replenished through through breeding in abu dhabi in pakistan so of course the french jumped into it it was a good um, a way of their sort of coming with a with a story that they they could do it and of course they have been at it for 20 years and finally they have something to show but in the beginning it was all you know like snake oil to uh, to do miracles and uh, so so but we have been lucky in the sense that uh, then come to pakistan also realized that to allow them a free run of the whole country was not advisable so then they said they divided the whole area in which the hubara would come during the winter into blocks and they said you can hunt here you can't hunt there hoping that the area which was uh, sort of uh, proscribed not to be hunted in they would breed there so this is what has happened and overall number of hubara i would say has not disappeared because they've been hunting every year for the last 30 years uh, you know without mercy and uh, and of course they they have no restriction on bags uh, if you say you can hunt x number of things they would have 10x and because they won't allow anybody to go into their into their camps so it's been a very challenging 
um, thing for WWF, but I would say today the overall thing is that there is some discipline with the Arabs and Pakistan also wants them to come every year because they bring in a lot of foreign exchange. So we don't want them to come here and not find any birds. So, but, but this is a very small uh, activity as far as WWF is concerned. One of the things where one can take uh, some kind of satisfaction is that during my tenure as the head of WWF here and abroad, we encouraged trophy hunting. We went to the government and we said, the only way to preserve these animals is to get the local population they should have an interest in people to come and hunt. And I must say the government of Pakistan was readily uh, sort of amenable to our suggestion that 80% of the license fee would go to the people who would be looking after these animals. Previously, these uh, people from uh, your area, from Hunza, from uh, other uh, areas, would look at an Ibex for meat. Now they look at an ibex as fifty thousand dollars worth of animal, and they, it's in their interest that every animal is protected. So we, the government spends hardly any money in protecting these animals. It's the local population that has taken over, and I would believe, I would imagine that every year, about a million dollars is is given in license fees, uh, which is distributed among the people of Chitral, Hunza and other um, wildlife areas. Of course, there are certain animals which are totally forbidden. And one is the Marco Polo sheep, which uh, roams across the border between us and, uh, and China and, and Afghanistan in the Wakhan area. So, so it, but and, you know, that is one aspect. The other is that we have, um, uh, we have worked very hard on, um, on cleaning of the lakes, on preserving of the dolphins in the rivers, we have educated the fishermen, we have rewarded them, we, in, and the other thing is also we give a, a compensation to villagers up in the north if their animals are, uh, are destroyed by wildlife like, like snow leopard or, or panthers, we compensate them so that they would not go and kill these animals. So I think there is there are many more marcos and ibex today than Pakistan has ever seen. And so are more snow leopards and panthers because we compensate the people who, you know, suffer as a result of the, you know, these animals have to eat and, and keep, you know, maintain the balance. Yeah, I mean, I can testify to everything that you've said because I have seen an ibex right, standing right next to me. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, you mentioned the government and the bureaucracy and how they sometimes exploit things. Over the time, I'm sure that you must have worked with different political regimes. Did that impact the leadership at WWF and did it impact the working or no, functioning of WWF? it's a totally independent organization. We have a board of directors. We have an executive director uh, who uh, is a professional. We send them abroad to interact with other wildlife organizations to learn from them and we have an excellent network. Pakistan, though small in size, I would say is among the 10 very important WWF organizations in the world today and it's recognized by the contribution that we make in international meetings and in how we have developed here. We have over 100 people working for WWF whole time. We encourage youngsters to come and do internships so that they get imbibed in this um, uh, conservation as, as something of interest to them. We have a budget of about a billion rupees a year that is being spent on conservation today. And, and this is all uh, raised internationally and locally and international money would not come unless they knew we were spending it well. So how did you feel when you spotted your first ibex or first snow leopard? Have you ever had that encounter and what were your emotions? No, I was, um, well, of course, I've seen them in the zoo, but this is the first time you've seen lion life. It's uh, an animal which is much more healthy 
uh, and as uh, more agile, uh, free. The animal is in his territory, his kingdom. He's the ruler of that place. So that's a wonderful feeling. Right. And I recognize that you and the Duke of Edinburgh went to Hunza for trophy hunting twice. What happened there? No, no, Did you... it wasn't for trophy hunting. With, with Prince Philip, it was only to see uh, the, the, what, what WWF had done in the northern areas. Right. But for trophy hunting, I went with Tom Roberts. Right. Uh, that was um, way back before WWF was even formed. And uh, we went and camped in uh, Karga Valley, you know, which is outside uh, Gilgit. And it was a fantastic, uh, I'd never s slept under a tent before, can the canvas. It was wonderful. We had uh, two Swedes, an Englishman and myself, four of us. And it was wonderful com comradeship. And uh, we um, had uh, these local um, guides and local uh, shikaris. Uh, who made us walk and um, on hindsight, I'm very happy we never shot anything. Uh, but uh, it was a wonderful uh, uh, outing. Uh, the people there were very simple, uh, kind, hospitable uh, and, um, and uh, generous. You know, we, we at this camp, um, we used to have these um, shepherds who would go past our camp and they would stop over and milk their goats to give us milk without and we would insist on paying them. They said, no, you are our guests. So, you know, that kind of feeling one uh, felt that it was uh, working. Uh, people who were very poor, they needed money, but they wouldn't sell their milk to us. Yeah. So it was a very very uh, rewarding experience. Yeah, I think that's the culture of, of that region. Your working relationship with the two presidents of WWF, uh, Prince Bernard and Prince Philip, developed into a personal friendship. Um, how would you explain that bond that you well, have? Well, I would call it friendship. I would, would call it acquaintance because royalty is at another level altogether. You can't take them for granted. But uh, I can tell you of the two, uh, though I spent more time with Prince Philip, he's been very, very kind to me throughout. I mean, the fact that he chose me to be to be his successor, I mean, speaks volumes of his kindness to me. But the person who was much more warm towards me uh, was Prince Bernard. Uh, though uh, my action with him, interaction with him was only in the in the few years, but uh, he so, uh, you know, he would come to these meetings, he would meet me and he would insist that whenever I went to Europe, I should go and see him. For his 80th birthday and for the 50th anniversary of the founding of WWF, we had a meeting in, um, in Spain, in Seville. And this was on 9-11. You know, we were there when this tragedy took place in New York. And there was a gala dinner that night, which uh, we thought would be cancelled, but both Prince Pinot and Bernard decided that at that time they didn't know the intensity of this, this, uh, this tragedy of 9-11. So the, and because I was vice president of WWF at that time, and I was to sit at the table of Prince Philip, the table plan had been made, had been approved by both the princes, and uh, so I was on. And when Prince Bernard saw that I was not on his table, he sent instructions. He said, "Somebody else can go and see it on Prince Philip because he was the elder of the two princes." You see, so he insisted that I sit on his table. My wife and him sit on his table. That was his his graciousness and kindness, but. On my last visit to him, which turned out to be the last visit, as I got, uh, you know, got down, uh, his ADC told me, he said, he's waiting for you, but he has fever. So I said, I don't want to disturb him, I'm going back. He said, no, he insists that you come in. So I walked in and of course he was sitting in, 
in his reception room and my wife and I walked in and he greeted us very warmly. And he said, you know what I'm doing? He said, I'm making out a list of the people who have to be invited to my funeral and a list of the people who are not to be invited to my funeral. I mean, that's the last thing you want to hear from somebody. And he said, you know, this is the first time I'm not getting up to greet you because I'm not feeling well. So that was how gracious he was. And um, I happened to be in Europe two weeks later when the news came that he had passed away. So I then called up the office of WWF to check up with the palace, uh, you know, Prince Bernard's palace as to whether I was expected to be at his funeral or not. And of course, the call came back that I was there. So we attended the funeral. It was very well organized as one expects. Everything ran to the second and uh, very meticulous. There was royalty from all over Europe. All his personal friends were there and I was in the group that he knew personally. Then um, after the, you know, the, the, um, the uh, service was over, we were invited by his daughter, who was the queen, to, for, um, uh, you know, to go and meet her. Uh, and uh, sort of, so we went to, and she, she didn't see me at this funeral, but as I walked up, because she knew me, because she had at one time been on the board of WWF and her father was the president. So she, I walked up to her and said, thank you very much for coming from such a long distance. She knew I was from Pakistan. And then, of course, we were there and they served us coffee and cheese and all that, which is a part of their you know, kind of uh, way they thank people for coming to, to such an occasion. And then, of course, when we were coming out, I went to, you know, sort of take leave and thank her. And she said, do you know he had a list of people who are not to be invited? <laughs> you know, I, he only shared it with me, but she knew about it. And she said, we could not follow it. We had to invite some people that he didn't like. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so that was the relationship I have with Prince Bernard. And you know, when we were with him at this last meeting, my wife said, can we have a picture with you? And he said, sure. So he was sitting there and I was on one side and he was holding our hand. And that buddy, I, he had some kind of a feeling that he was screening us for the last time. So he wrote a letter to me that very day. He said, it was wonderful to see you. God bless you. So I put that note under the picture that we had at that time. That was the last time. This was two weeks before he died. Uh, and uh, and when the Prince um, Philip again, I mean, uh, as I said, that he was always very gracious to me. And after I took over, I wrote to him that I was coming to England and could I come and pay my respects to him. And he invited me to, to Windsor to, um, to go and see him. He invited me for lunch. And... Uh, I asked him, I said, how, you know, I told him at the very beginning that I will not stay in WWF for the full term, which is five years. So I asked him, I said, how long do you think I should be here? So he said, I think you should be here for at least three annual meetings to have an impact on uh, what you are trying to do. So I followed his advice. So he was very gracious. So I sent him a copy of my biography. And that very day he wrote back to me. He said, um, which I've published, sent in, uh, you know, printed in the subsequent edition. He said, um, thank you for your sp splendid biography. Without, he just read the chapter on, um, on WWF. But he, he has been very gracious, very gracious. So I read somewhere that Prince Philip has a very good sense of humor. Did he ever leave you in stitches of laughter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He told hundreds of stories which cannot even be repeated. But uh, he had a very, uh, I must say, uh, you know, we, um, when we had these executive board meetings or the board meetings, it always ended up with a meal, mostly lunches. And he was totally relaxed. Um, I must tell you this story that he, he even mentioned in a 
large gathering of both men and women. He said he was on a trip to China and he'd gone to see this um, reservation of the panda in Wulong. And he said he had a long day and he came back to this particular camp where they were to, uh, you know, have lunch and, and rest and relax. And he came back after a long drive and uh, he um, turned around to uh, his host and uh, he said, can I wash my hands? And of course, they brought the basin and he meant something else. So, and finally he said, I want to pee. And again, these Chinese were talking to each other and then they came and apologized, sir. Peas are not in season these days. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can't be more relaxed than that. Yeah, I was reading yesterday, I was actually reading something where uh, in his Golden Jubilee, uh, someone came and he said, who are you? And the guy said, I am the chief and editor of XYZ magazine. And Prince Philip said, but why are you here? And he said, because you invited me. And Prince Philip replied, just because I've invited you doesn't mean you have to come. He was not popular with the press and the press was not popular with him and uh, I attended a couple of uh, uh, press conferences uh, in London with him and this was a shouting match uh, he was not never comfortable uh, I mean he gave it as as he received it but uh, otherwise he was a very polite person very polite very gentle very hospitable very kind. No, I have uh, nothing but a uh, uh, lot of, um, I mean, much great, very grateful for uh, the opportunity that I had to spend with him in different countries because we, WW had meetings um, in, uh, well, we went to Argentina, we went to Australia, we went to uh, Austria, we went to the Netherlands. Uh, and of course, Switzerland was very common, and of course, England. And uh, he was always in Hong Kong. We were in Hong Kong together. No, very gracious, very gracious. So, no, it was a wonderful uh, uh, experience that I had. It, it's a wonderful memory that I carry. And when you took them to the northern areas of Pakistan, uh, what did your day look like? What were the conversations? No, no, we were, you know, I, I was with him 24 hours. We flew in his plane, uh, his personal flight, you know, the flight of the Queen from uh, Islamabad to uh, to Gilgit. And then we checked in at the Serena. We were there, you know, just four or five hours. And the next morning we drove to, uh, to Hunza. Uh, and uh, we then stayed in Hunza for the night with um, Mir Ghazanfar's house. We were there. And that evening uh, they laid on a a kind of a, a a party, you know, with the, with the, with the open fire and all that, and dancing, the local dancing and music. And of course, Prince Philip was spending time with the Mir and and the Rani of Hunza, and I was sitting with the with the local deputy commissioner. And uh, inquisitive as I am, I asked him. I said, "Is there any crime here?" He said, "No, I've been that he'd been there." He doesn't didn't belong to that area. No, he belonged to the civil service. He said he'd been there for a year and a half, and there was not a single major crime or a, even a theft. I said, "What about um, abduction?" You know, we have very pretty girls here. He said, "You know, the penalty for adoption is that the people, not only the girls' family, but the people of the village, go to the house." of the person who was abducted and they burned the whole house down. So the penalty is so high. So the next morning, when we were for breakfast, I, we were about five or six of us, Prince Philip and his staff and myself, and I narrated this story of this thing. And if you recall, a couple of years earlier, the um, main downing hall at Windsor had been burned down. And he said, oh, maybe Charles ran away with somebody's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he, he, he had the, 
the uh, ability to to laugh at himself. And since you've led um, WWF local and international, when you look for people, when you choose the leadership, when you choose your staff, what kind of traits were you looking for? Well, I mean, uh, you know, the, the as far as the permanent staff is concerned, you know, if there's a vacancy, they advertise worldwide because it's a very prestigious job, they pay well. And uh, so they select, it's only on merit, there's no, there's no. But, you know, I was very lucky when I left the international, they, they, uh, they appointed me as vice president emeritus. So I'm invited to all the board meetings of the international body. And when I retired from WWF Pakistan, they were kind enough to uh, appoint me as President Emeritus, which meant that I could attend, which I do here uh, whenever I'm available to attend the meeting. So I'm not cut off. I'm very much in touch. Uh, I regularly get uh, minutes of the board meeting of the international organization. I get nomination papers to uh, from the current board to uh, suggest names for the international board if I could think of somebody. So I'm in touch. I mean, I'm not cut off uh, and it's, uh, it has been a part of my life for over 30 years and you can't take it out of me. And how was WWF perceived by the public? Was there any challenge? How did you change Initially, the Initially, it was supposed to be, it was thought of a group of royalty and uh, people, the elite. But then they worked their work down to, to um, into the corporate world where they where they worked with the corporate world to um, ensure that there would be sustain sustainability. Sustainability of forests, sustainability of fishing, sustainability of whatever these people required by way of their raw material, you know, the Unilevers and the PNGs of this world and these Nestle's of this world. They all signed up to support w uh, WWF because it, uh, it meant uh, that uh, they were working in the larger interests of the future of the companies and the, of the world. And in terms of education and awareness? Did yes, you... You know, to the schools, we would, we would interact with schools, colleges, universities. We would give scholarships. We would help them improve their curricula and, and invite their people, to their students to come as internees to different organizations around the world to come and see for themselves as to what we are doing and bring their academic knowledge into the organization and take experience and knowledge from the organization into the classroom. So it's a two-way traffic. And Baba says, since you are a businessman and you're also very conscious of the environmental degradation, generally business and environmental ethics do not go hand in hand. But they have to if they, have, if they want to live long. Yeah, but do we have examples of Yeah, yeah, because I mean, today it's a compulsory that the water that you let, that you comes out should be no worse than the water that goes in, into a factory for usage. So you have to take away all the impurities out which are harmful. Right. And so is the air. You have to clean up the air. Make sure that you are not throwing carbon into the air. You have to, uh, you know, have to have filters or whatever is necessary to have a clean smoke. So Babar Sahib, because you have worked for such a long time in this area and with this organization, what do you think were some of the key policy and research gaps that we cannot solve this problem? Well, the most important thing is first to um, educate the government and to bring in such regu regulations that can be, can be implemented and to help them draft those regulations. Help them not only draft regulations, help them solve issues. Take for instance, Kasur. Kasur has been a big center for tanneries and they use a lot of chrome. And we help them draft, not only draft the laws as to the affluent coming out of the tanneries, but we help the tanneries how to recover the chrome from the affluent. And they find it, it's, it's economical. It spares them to, to recover the chrome that, rather than throw it away. They can reuse it. So it's a question of education, persuasion, and also the stick of the government should be there to tell them that you 
have to behave and we 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 don't police for the government but we certainly help the government uh, 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 monitor right and pakistan is a very diverse country the divide between the rich and the poor the urban and the ruler or those who are accessible is huge but if you could just put all of us into one stream and rate us as uh, as a nation that would care for conservation of biological diversity do you think we are an animal loving nation or i would say so i would not say that we are uh, you know many nations eat dogs cats anything that moves or flies or swims we are not that i mean part the religious what is halal and what is haram but generally people are um, uh, are are sympathetic uh, and the poor are much more sensitive to the needs of the animals than the rich are uh, so i see what uh, you know tradition is there uh, you know there are uh, historical narrations stories of um, you know even from the time of the prophet they they were marching in a certain valley and there were some animals had just delivered a litter and he said we are not going to disturb this we are going to take another path i mean that is a part of your religion so i would say that by and large people of this country do not need education to be sensitive to preservation to conservation not only animals to trees to plants uh, it's it's uh, it's something but our younger generation which is half educated uh, they they need to be disciplined and it can only be done if you take this message to the schools to the high schools to the colleges universities and make people more animal loving plant loving flower loving grass loving uh, you you need to make them more sensitive to the the blessings of nature exactly and before i ask you my final question how would you summarize your role in the wwf very little very little uh, i've been very lucky i found people who were who were much more devoted than i was who were um, were hard working who of course made a living out of conservation but it's not a one man effort it is a team effort it's a group effort it is a, a community effort so you got to keep on uh, reminding those people you have got to keep on energizing those people you have to keep on um, acknowledging them you have to respect them so it's it's an ongoing uh, uh, you know effort and uh, i hope it will be there for all times to come because we will whether it's 100 years from year from now or 1000 years from now you will need trees you will need animals you will need birds you will need fish you will need butterflies so all these are part of your life and i hope the future generation will preserve them so speaking of future generations uh, is there any thought any challenge any issue relating to conservation of biological diversity that you now pass want to pass on to the future generations well i mean the the moment the, the moment they they are exposed to knowledge they are informed as to what is important and how important the bees are for instance in pollination and things like that even a small bee is very necessary for uh, for you to have a good crop or a good fruit so this is something that uh, has to be driven into them it's not something which is a nuisance so we have to um, keep on educating educating people and it's up to you people from the academic world how effective you are in communicating make it simple make it uh, more exciting make it more rewarding power sir thank you so very much i hope I it have... was some of some use i have learned a lot from you you know your personal life as well as your journey in the wwf thank and you. i have a lot to reflect on when i go well, home thank you so much spread it out <laughs> and share it with others sure sure
the Quran keep keeps on stressing on you go after knowledge. Exactly, sir. And it doesn't define go after a, a particular knowledge. Go after any knowledge. You can't say this is un-Islamic. There's no such thing as un-Islamic. Mm -hmm.